Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Lee Kuan Yew, who died recently at the age of 91. He was the founding father of modern Singapore, and he ruled the country for almost 60 years after it broke away from British colonial rule. He turned it from a backwater swamp into one of the most thriving economies in the world, despite being criticized for clamping down on human rights. Here's a report on the death of Lee Kuan Yew. Singapore's first prime minister and renowned statesman Lee Kuan Yew has died at the age of 91. Lee was the architect of the tiny city-state's rapid rise from British military outpost to global trade and financial centre. Respected on the international scene, he's been described as one of Asia's most inspiring leaders, but at the same time he attracted criticism for his iron grip on power. Under him, freedom of speech was tightly restricted and there was little tolerance for opposition views or dissent. Considered a charismatic figure, Lee co-founded the People's Action Party, which has governed Singapore since 1959. He served as Prime Minister for 31 years and continued to work in government until 2011. Lee Kuan Yew is British Chinese, a lawyer. Singapore broke away from Britain in 1959 and joined Malay in 1963. And here he makes the announcement. Friends and fellow citizens, today for us is a day of fulfillment. It holds out a promise of a greater future in a larger security. Under firm leadership, we shall endure and find our niche in the history of Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, there were ethnic and political tensions between the Singaporeans and the Malaysians, and so the two broke away in 1965 to form separate republics. Here's a report on what happened. The People's Action Party, co-founded by Lee Kuan Yew, began its rule of Singapore six years before its independence half a century ago. Lee was the nation's first prime minister. He spearheaded the island's independence from Britain in 1959. Singapore joined the post-colonial Federation of Malaysia, a grouping of former British territories, in 1963. When it was expelled two years later after violent ethnic clashes, Lee was visibly upset. You see, the whole of my adult life, I have believed in Malaysia and merger and the unity of these two territories. You know, as a people connected by geography, economics, and ties of kinship, will you mind if we stop for a while? Lee led Singapore's rapid rise from former British tropical outpost to global trade and financial centre. He stepped down in 1990 as the world's longest serving prime minister. He stayed on in the cabinet until 2011. He was a member of parliament until his death. Under Lee, Singapore's economy has flourished. Political opposition and an independent media have not been allowed to thrive, however, drawing criticism for heavy-handed government. Even so, Singapore, marking the 50th anniversary of its birth this year, is hailed as one of Asia's most livable and corruption-free nations. Singaporeans were more Chinese, less Islamic, and more industrious than the Malaysians. But part of the Singapore miracle came at the expense of personal freedoms. We had to lock up people without trial, whether they are communists, whether they are language, chauvinists, or religious extremists. If you don't do that, the country would be in ruins today. We would not have made the economic progress if we had not intervened on very personal matters. Who your neighbor is, how you live, the noise you make, how you spit or where you spit or what language you use. Had we not done that and done it effectively, we would not be here today. Here's the official state announcement from Singapore on Lee Kuan Yew's death. Good morning, my fellow Singaporeans. I'm deeply saddened to tell you that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew passed away peacefully this morning at the Singapore General Hospital. The first of our founding fathers is no more. He inspired us, gave us courage, kept us together, and brought us here. He fought for our independence, built a nation where there was none, and made us proud to be Singaporean. We won't see another man like him. To many Singaporeans, and indeed others too, Lee Kuan Yew was Singapore. As Prime Minister, he pushed us hard to achieve what had seemed impossible. After he stepped down, he guided his successors with wisdom and tact. In the old age, he continued to keep a watchful eye on Singapore. Singapore was his abiding passion. He gave of himself in full measure to Singapore. As he himself put it towards the end of his life, I have spent my life, so much of it, building up this country. There's nothing more that I need to do. At the end of the day, what have I got? A successful Singapore. What have I given up? 
my life. I am grieved beyond words at the passing of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. I know that we all feel the same way. But even as we mourn his passing, let us also honour his spirit. Let us dedicate ourselves as one people to build on his foundations, strive for his ideals, and keep Singapore exceptional and successful for many years to come. May Mr. Lee Kuan Yew rest in peace. He hoped he'd make it for the 50th anniversary of Singapore's independence, but he just missed it. We're going to move on now to Bernard Buddy Elias, who died recently at the age of 89, and he was the last surviving close relative of Anne Frank, the keeper of her legacy. And he's actually the last person who can talk about her in the first person. He spent the war in Switzerland, so he wasn't captured by the Nazis. And we're going to feature a little bit of his story about his cousin Anne Frank. I was four years older than Anne. But Anne and I got along so wonderfully. Anne was a, a wildfire. She knew what to play. She had ideas. She was lively. She was cute. The last time I saw her was before the war, of course, when they visited the last time with us in Switzerland. She loved as you know, probably the world knows, film stars and things like that. So she said, buddy, <clears throat> go to the closet of grandmother and put on a dress of grandmother and a hat and imitate her. She loved it. She, she laughed very much. This was my last uh, remembrance of Anna personally. She was always positive in everything she did. I'm sure in, in the hideout there were many many moments, many days where she was uh, subdued or, 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 or sad. But with me, I only, I only have positive memories of her. Anne, who loved to, uh, to flirt with boys in school already, and Anne was Otto's child. It was for Otto very difficult to keep the peace. But he was the one everyone turned to. Otto, please do something about it. Otto, please do that. He was the, uh, the one person who tried to keep peace between all the in inhabitants of the annex. And it was a little a little explosion. In lock, locked up it, without any possibility to get out, of course, this became more and more. And I wanted to to get out. And I wanted to be free. And I wanted to go to school. And it was full of ideas. But she had no one to talk to. I mean, of course, she had wonderful connection with her father, not so much with her mother. <clears throat> with the other in the secret annex, not very much. What she really needed was someone she could talk to. So she developed this great talent for writing because she wanted to get rid of all her thoughts and feelings. And she made Kitty the Diary her girlfriend. Wonderful, deep, humanistic book. Many people, uh, through Anna's diary, get the first connection to the Holocaust. They didn't know any before what, what was the Holocaust. And then they read the diary of Anna Frank, and through that, they learn about the Holocaust, they learn about discrimination, they learn about differences of religion. They get more interested in humanistic questions through, the, through Anna Frank's diary. After Otto returned back to Europe, he had heard from a an eyewitness that aided his wife had perished in Auschwitz. Just stopped eating the little bread she received. She stopped eating it because she wanted to save it for the children. If they would come back, they had been transported to Bergen-Belsen. And for one, one month, he was going to the train station asking people that came back from the east, have you seen my children? Has anyone, does anyone know about my children? He found a lady in Holland who was with the children during the last weeks of their lives in Bergen-Belsen. And he went there and, and this lady had to tell them they are no more. And this lady later on sent him an eyewitness report about the last days of Anna and Margot. I have it and it's terrible. It's deeply sad. Otto didn't want to publish it. He said, no, why? This is the intimate diary of my child and who could be interested in it? But then he, he gave the diary to several of his friends and they all said, Otto, it has to be published. And then he remembered Anna's dream that something she had written would maybe sometime, somewhere be published. And then he said, OK. It was tremendously difficult. All the publishers said, a book about the war? No, no, we're not interested. Until one day, a Dutch historian name of Romaine, has read the diary and he wrote an article in the biggest Dutch newspaper at Parole 
And then a publisher came forward and said, OK, I'm interested, but please, not all, just excerpts. And then poor Otto had to put it together, what would be interesting. He, he had to eliminate quite a few things. He wanted to eliminate a few things. Otto made the first translation of the diary for us in Basel and Switzerland into German. And that's where I read, but we all in the family in Basel read it for the first time. I was just as stunned as Otto was. Otto always said I didn't know my daughter until I read her diary. Of course I saw I still Annie in it. I mean, her, her humor, her uh, what she writes sometimes, I could see Annie. The whole book, everything was a new Anna to her humanistic thinking. For a child to write uh, about that there is always enough money for arms, but never enough for the arts and the poor, where she writes about the strength of men, that nobody writes about the strength of women, what they have to go through. Her deep thoughts are, were not the thoughts of, a chi of the child that I knew. They were the thoughts of a, of a grown-up writer. It was the most important thing in Otto's life after Auschwitz. He saw what the diary means, especially for young people, and it became his main object in life to further humanistic ideas in the name of his daughter, Anna Frank. We're going to close tonight with Jackie Trent, who died recently at the age of 74. You may not know her name, but you definitely know her music. She's part of the most successful English songwriting duo in history outside of Lennon and McCartney, along with her husband, Tony Hatch. She was a performer also in 1965. She had a number one in Britain during the height of the British invasion. It's called Where Are You Now, My Love, and it topped everything by the Stones, the Beatles, and the Kinks. When shadows of evening gently fall, the memory of you I soon recall. We walked in the rain. In 1966, she married Tony Hatch, who was the British Burt Bacharach, writing primarily for Petula Clark. Pop hit composer Tony Hatch was at the register office to marry his songwriter partner, Jackie Trent. And in a car fit for a distinguished bride came Jackie herself. We were the best, I would say. Well, they basically called us the British Bacharach and David. And it was one of those things where we were still only in our 20s, and everything we touched turned to God. She teamed up writing songs for Petula Clark with her husband, Tony Hatch, including this one based on their relationship. You wear two hats. I know we couldn't live without your love. I wrote that, and I was going to go in and record it. And then Cold Wolf, Pet's husband, came up and said, we need a song for Petula, and she recorded it. No one knows the Here's one of my favorite songs by Jackie Trent and Tony Hatch. It's called You Gotta Be Loved by a group called the Montanas. Should have been a big hit in the States in 68, but it wasn't. But it's got that sound. You gotta be loved, yeah, you gotta be loved all the way. Every hour, every day, I'll be there. You gotta be loved, yeah, you gotta be loved all the time. I'm going to close on that and I want to thank my producer and IT genius Sid Taps. Tony Hatch divorced Jackie Trent after 28 years of marriage, but we still have her great music. And we'll close with another one of my favorites that she wrote for Petula Clark called Who Am I? Every day is just the same. I'm chasing rainbows in the rain. All the dreams that I I'm reaching far too high For I have something else entirely free Love of someone close to me Unfettered by the world That hurries by To question such good fortune Who am I?